My name is Kenneth Townsend and I um, help oversee the Public Events Committee which coordinates our Friday Forum series. This is our first forum of the semester and we're delighted that all of you could be present. Uh, in just a second I'm going to hand it off to Sue Carey who's going to provide an introduction for our speaker Martha McDonald. If you've seen some of the advertisements you know that we're in for a treat today. We've got some, a really creative uh, personality with us who is going to do something that I don't think we've ever really seen in a Friday Forum before. So uh, welcome, glad you're here. Without any further ado, Sue Carey. Hi everybody, um, I'm Sue Curry John and I'm one of the studio art professors here and um, I just want to thank you all for joining us for this talk and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Martha McDonald. Uh, Martha McDonald is an interdisciplinary artist whose performances and installations feature handcrafted costumes and objects that she activates through gestures of making and unmaking and singing to transmit narrative. She often focuses on site-specific interventions in historic house museums and botanic gardens that uncover hidden histories of the site. Uh, she, re she received her MFA from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. McDonald's work has been shown internationally at venues including Linden Center of Contemporary Art in Melbourne, Australia, Elizabeth Bay House in Sydney, Australia. She's also exhibited nationally. Her work has been presented at the Joyce Soho and PS122 in New York. Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., Evergreen Museum and Library in Baltimore, um, and in Philadelphia at the Institute of Contemporary Art, the Woodlands, and the Rosenbach Museum and Library, among many others. She's also received fellowships from the McDowell Company Colony and uh, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts and the Independence Foundation. So, very impressive, and we're so happy to have her here. Um, so without further ado, Martha, I'll hand it over to you, and I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Um, do you uh, do you need me to speak in the microphone, or can you hear me yes. now? Microphone. Okay. All right. Um, all right, well, um, it's lovely to be here, and I've had a really amazing um, day and a half meeting a lot of the students in the um, fine art department here, and um, thank you for being such a wonder, wonderful host to me. Um, as Sue Carey mentioned, um, I do um, a lot of site-specific work, um, and, you know, in um, historic houses or botanic gardens, um, I, I've done work in um, rare book libraries and museums. Um, a lot of my work happens on, is um, the perform there are installations and performances that happen on site at these places. Um, sometimes I do show work in galleries, and I guess the thing that is kind of a constant across all of my work is the the sort of deep research that I do in in making the performances and the installation. So I tend to really dig into a, um, a time period or, or his, his, of history or the history of a site and then um, really make kind of a, a performative response to that. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, talk to you a little bit about, um, first, a, a, a large body of work that I made um, engaging with um, Victorian mourning culture. Um, especially because the picture on the poster I was wearing a, more, a black morning dress, so I thought I, I would address that a little bit. And then I'll talk about some other um, more recent work that I made. Um, so I, um, when I moved to Melbourne, Australia, and I was sort of feeling a bit, um, a bit lost, um, trying to find my way, um, I did what I often do, which is I, I, I haunt the libraries and, and, the, and museums and sort of look for inspiration, and I, I stumbled upon an exhibition about, um, it was called Black in Fashion, From Morning Till Night, and it was all about black clothing, and there was a big section of it about Victorian morning dress. And so I got very interested in all of the kind of, you know, the rules and the rituals that 19th century women participated in um, as a way to memorialize um, dead loved ones. Um, and so I was very interested in all of the little, um, handcrafts that they would make, um, you know, jewelry made from human hair. Oh, yeah, I have to put the timer on to keep track of what's happening. Okay. Um, 
um, jewelry and flowers made from human, the, the hair of the lost loved one, and embroideries, and things that, that these very labor-intensive tasks that, were, that often served almost as a kind of meditation to help people think about the lost loved one and, and heal their grief. Um, I also became really interested in um, the, um, the dresses that, that women wore and all the, what seemed to me to be sort of very intense rules and regulations about what you had to wear. Or, you know, because the woman in the household was, was really carrying the labor of, um, of remembrance for the family. And so there were very, very strict rules about what you had to wear, um, you know, depending on the distance, you know, whether it was a, a re distant relative or, or, or a, a child or a husband. And probably the most extreme was when your husband died. You had, you, a woman had to wear black for three years and she was sequestered in her home for most of that time period. And um, the, um, there were even rules about what kind of fabric your dress could be made out of. So for instance, in the first year, like this dress here would clearly have been in the second year of mourning because it has a, a bit of a shine to it. Um, in the first year of mourning, nothing you wore could reflect the light. So you either had to wear crepe or wool bombazine um, out of respect for the dead. And um, I, kept reading, I was reading all these, you know, ladies' magazines from the time period in, in, in libraries, and I kept coming across these recipes for how to remove the black ink from your body. Apparently, women, when they sweated or got caught in the rain, often got stained by their mourning dresses. And I thought, wow, this is so intense. Um, like, it wasn't enough to be this, to have this outward sign of grief, but you are actually experiencing it in this very sort of physical, corporal way on your body. And there, you know, there, I, as I dug deeper into this, I, I discovered that this was because in, you know, up until about 1850 or 60 when they invented the chemical dyes that allow us to have bright colors now, um, all the, um, the dyes were made from natural um, plant fibers. And so there's not that many, the black does not occur in nature that much. It's in oak gall um, and a few other things, but usually what they would do is they would take indigo and they would over dye it again and again and again to try to get some semblance of black. So especially in the crepe and the bulbamazine, it was a really unstable dye. And so that's why people were getting stained. So I decided that I wanted to do a mix, I, I wanted to make my own um, sort of Victorian morning dress out of um, black crepe paper. Um, so that, because I had discovered that when I spilled some water on a piece of crepe paper in my studio, it ran black. And so I thought, well, this would be a great way to sort of take this small gesture of the stain and, and take it to this sort of performative extreme. So I, I made this dress and I stood on a platform in a, um, in a gallery and above my head, um, you, you see this white box and this kind of my home jobby rain machine, which is basically a, a, a big plastic box that I drilled tons and tons of tiny, tiny holes in. And there was a hose going into the kitchen in the gallery. And once the water filled to a certain level, the pressure of it uh, forced the water through the tiny holes. And I was, um, there was a, a gentle rain falling on me for about a half hour while I was singing. Um, and then at the end, that's what happened. Um, you know, a lot of the dye came out of the dress and created this sort of lake around me, which then left this kind of stain or this trace behind. Um, so here's the dress when it was fresh and new, <laughs> and then there's the dress at the end of the performance. And I was, um, I, when I, I didn't, um, you know, I was very much interested in the idea of the stain and the trace that it would leave behind, but what I realized after I made the, the that I saw these photographs was that it also kind of, it really addressed this idea that I'm very interested in about impermanence and about how um, the um, you know th th this dress that took months for me to make in my studio with all this like hand cutting of the crepe paper and hand stitching, um, it you know within a half hour it had been reduced to this like a, a wilted flower like this. So I felt like the um, it was an interesting way also to express kind of impermanence. And then I, after the performance, I, um, somebody helped me carefully out of the dress and I laid it out on plastic. And then the next day I came back into the gallery and I installed it in the space, hanging over its, you know, its own stain. And then the, um, I, I edited together a five minute video of the, of the piece and that was also shown in the gallery along with some photographs. Um, so then when I returned to um, the States, to Philadelphia in 2012, um, 
I, um, you know, I was showing my work to people. This is the work I made in Australia, and um, I was invited to um, make a project at a Victorian cemetery in um, Philadelphia that's called the Woodlands. And um, as I researched the site, um, I, I discovered that before it was a cemetery, it became a cemetery in I think 18. 60, but before it was a cemetery, it was actually a an amazing botanic garden. This is a, a like a um, an image of it when it was a garden, and it was one of the most famous gardens in the early, you know, when when the um, colonies became a, a nation and people started coming and visiting. They would, um, you know, from from uh, from other other countries that they would visit um, the woodlands. And in fact, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson they um, took plants from this garden um, in order to make their gardens, their, which are still quite famous. Um, and when Lewis and Clark went, um, you know, did their, their um, expeditions out west, a lot of the, um, the specimens that they brought back were entrusted to William Hamilton, the, the owner of this garden, um, to be propagated in his greenhouse. He had a greenhouse that was twice the size of his mansion. And um, so it was his whole life work, and he, you know, um, the, he built his whole life around this, this garden. His house was built with all these windows so that you could, in pretty much every room, see the garden. Um, he, and so it was really his, like I said, his life work. He didn't have any children, and then when he died, um, he left the house and the garden and the greenhouse to his niece and nephew, and I'm sure you know where this story is going. Um, within 30 years of his death, 90% of the property had been sold off. Um, actually to the University of Pennsylvania um, to expand the campus. And so um, when they were, after 30 years when there was just the mansion and a small part of the garden and a dilapidated greenhouse left over, um, a few people got together and decided to turn that um, property into a cemetery. Because during, at that point in time, people were now not, they were no longer being buried around churches in the city. They were taking the bodies out into the um, sort of suburbs or almost country, and they were creating um, these, ru I can't say this word, rural cemeteries um, where people could, they were like memory gardens where people could go and sit um, by a grave of their loved one and have a picnic or, or just relax. Um, so the woodlands, um, the garden was turned into the woodlands, the cemetery. So I was really touched by this idea that this guy, William Hamilton's whole life work that he loved so much just disappeared when he died. Um, and so I wanted to do a, some sort of a performance that would memorialize or, um, you know, kind of conjure the dream, could memorialize his lost garden, so the piece was called The Lost Garden, and to also kind of conjure the dream of the lost garden. So um, I put myself into another black dress and I took um, audiences on um, this was a performance in the cemetery that ended in an installation in the mansion, which is an empty mansion now. It's almost kind of like a ruin. But um, so I took people on uh, like a song tour of the garden. I don't know if I mentioned, but I, I sing in all of my pieces, and so I was singing these laments um, and, and leading people through the garden. Um, and there are all these like really interesting sort of circuitous paths that you can take, some of which were paths that, that, that dated back to when it was a garden. So I would sometimes, I had someone who was like a guide, taking people on a, that, you know, they were told they were on a contemplative walk, um, you know, turn off your cell phones, um, limit your talking, and just be in the cemetery. Um, and because the cemetery is in a, um, it's in an urban area, so it's a really interesting sort of rubbing up of the past and the present. Like you're in this place that looks like this or this. I mean, it's very idyllic and you could be, it could be the 19th century. And then, you know, a train would go by or uh, a you know, a siren on the street or horns are honking or, or someone's jogging by. And so it was this really interesting kind of intersection for people to sort of think about the past and the present. Um, and. Uh, every once in a while, I would appear from some other path and you know sing a song for them. I was cutting out little oak leaves out of um, out of black felt and giving them to people, sort of as memento mori of the lost garden. And then I took them inside the mansion where I had um, I had installed these I, um, 
these domed, they were um, these domed kind of memento mori to the um, to the lost plants from William Hamilton's garden. Um, the the building, I was really, I really try to respond not just to the stories but to the physical space. And so the building had these amazing sort of domed shapes. And then this is the entryway where I um, where I'm standing, and you know that was a dome. And then there were these like domed sort of recesses that. In the 18th century, when it was built, they would have probably held some kind of like Greeky sort of figurative sculpture. But to me, they really looked like like they were just crying out to have a dome in them. And so, um, I <clears throat> and then there was another room that had more of these recesses and then domed recesses within them. And so I sang. They also were amazing spaces for singing because when you when you moved around in the different spaces, that it really created a different kind of ac acoustics. Um, and so I. Continue, you know, look back again at Victorian morning culture, and I was looking at these domes that people have made. This is all um, hair. This is a this is a grave scene that is um, uh, you know, that that's sculpted from from human hair, and so that was a really common thing for people to do in the Victorian times. And I also was looking at these um, other kind of um, domes, these flower domes, and these were not. Funerary. These were not. These were just something like people would do for pleasure. Women would make these, would knit and embroider these flowers and put them under domes. It seems like if you start digging into like the Victorian times, like everything went under a dome. It was people had their dogs taxidermied when they died and put them under domes. And so people were really into domes in the Victorian times. So I decided that I would make. Um, so I, I, I um, in this book that I found about um, as I was researching the domes, they referenced patterns that would be published every month in these ladies' magazines, the same kind of ladies' magazines where I read about the recipes for the, for the um, removing the stains, I also found these knitting patterns for making these flowers. So, um, uh, so I started to make, um, let's see, this, which is the one, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when I get to the one that was actually from the knitting pattern. This is one where I made up the pattern myself, but I started by trying to crack the code of how they even, and there were no pictures, of course, um, and, and most of them started with a statement, knit in the usual way, <laughs> okay. and they didn't say what size needle or what size you know, yarn to use, and so I was really like, okay. Um, I made, the first one I made was a, um, oak leaf, oak leaf and acorn, and the first acorn was like the size of an apple, so I was like, all right, well clearly I need to be using smaller needles and smaller yarn, or thinner yarn. Um, but I started by making a couple of patterns from the um, from the, um, the the magazines, and then I decided that I would um, I really wanted to focus on plants that, that William Hamilton actually had in his garden, and I had access to letters that he had written back and forth to friends, and where he would talk about certain plants that he really loved. And one of the he had this beloved tiger lily that he was talking about, so I, I knitted this. Um, the tiger lily, and the the top part of the of the um, the blossom is um, is obviously knitted, and the um, it has a, a kind of an elaborate wire structure to give it its shape. That that was what they told you to do in the um, in the Victorian patterns. And then the the leaves on this one are actually felted, like I knitted and then I felted the wool and cut them out because I wanted to be able to get like a finer point on the end of the leaves. Um, I knew from looking at the list of plants that Hamilton had, and from letters, that he had a um, and he had a lot of exotics, exotic plants um, from Australia, because you know there had recently been you know trips to Botany Bay, and um, Joseph Banks had gone and collected plants and was starting to classify them and bring them back to um, to you know Europe, and so the most common plant that came back. From Australia and survived was the Banksia, which is what this, this is a botanical drawing of a Banksia. Um, and I also, when I lived in Australia, had totally loved Bank Banksias, so I made a Banksia. And um, this is a close up of the Banksia. And then, oh, this is one of the ones that, um, this is the oak leaf, um, the oak um, tree and the acorns. This was the one that actually. The pattern taught you how to make one leaf and one acorn. I think people might have worn them as like, like little brooches or jewelry type thing. But I, I wanted to make it look like I was looking a lot at, at botanical illustrations, and I wanted to I wanted it to be as 
botanically accurate as possible, which is what they were trying for back then, and also to look like a, something like it that had just been pulled off a tree and stuck in this dome. And then the rose, um, which I know is a little bit Beauty and the Beast, um, <laughs> but that was also from the um, following a real pattern, uh, a Victorian pattern. And then this is just um, sort of what I was spending tons and tons of time looking at these botanical illustrations and trying to, um, you know, imitate these shapes and forms using, you know, knitting and, and, and wool. Um, this is a white pine, which um, uh, Hamilton had. And then there's the, um, the dome. That's the, I think that one kind of looks the most like a Victorian dome, the way it's kind of leaning down. and. It's like the, the branch is kind of mourning the loss of their fallen comrade on the ground. There he is. And then I kind of took a little bit of an artistic um, license with this because many people consider a thistle to be a weed, but I really like how they look, so I made a, a thistle. And then, and then one of, there was an, an extra dome that, that was, it appeared to be sort of crammed with flowers. And at, um, at the, towards the end of the performance, I took I took off the lid of the dome, and there was a skirt in there that had that I'm wearing here. It was like an overskirt, a black organza that had um, flowers attached to it, because I was trying to sort of shift from being in mourning to sort of celebrating the garden. And then I built it. This was the last room that I took people in, and this was where I sort of conjured the dream of the lost garden. And so people were looking at this garden. You can't really see in this picture, but you out the window was the Kurt was the cemetery. So you looked through the garden out into the cemetery. And that's just some close-ups of the plants that I made. And these were all things where I would knit a piece of, I'd knit something and then I'd put it in the washing machine and felt it and then I'd cut, I'd cut things out. Okay, and then this, um, this piece was sort of the, um, I don't want to say final, but so far the final piece I did on Victorian morning culture, um, or, or drawing on Victorian morning culture, um, and this was a piece where I was commissioned by the Smithsonian to make a piece in, res uh, in response to the National Portrait Gallery, um, either their, you know, the building or the history or a specific portrait in the gallery. So um, I went, you know, as I do, I go to the site, I spend time there, I. I sort of just try to, you know, intuit the space and and um, you know listen to the sounds, and then I in, I talk to the, you know I interview the staff people about the history of the place. I, I read what I can, you know, online and the books they give me. And so during the tour of the of the place, someone just casually mentioned, oh yeah, that when during the Civil War, when this building was the U.S. Patent Office, it was taken over um, as a temporary hospital for um, soldiers. Um, and Walt Whitman, the poet worked here as a nurse. And I was like, oh, really? Um, so, and then they're like, oh, but you might want to focus on this painting. And I was just like, okay, this is it. I, I definitely, I, I, was, I thought it was so amazing that we were in this building, this elaborate, gorgeous building, and um, all these people had died in there. And there was no plaque, there was no, if, you, if I hadn't gone on the tour and asked these people, tell me about the history of this building, I wouldn't have even known that. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do a performance where I can sort of conjure the memory of this um, the hospital, this building as a hospital. So um, I was able to have access to um, Walt Whitman. His he kept these little notebooks that literally like this big that could fit in his pocket. He would just take he made them himself. He would just take paper and do a little stitching on the side, and and then as he was working, you know, with. Um, he was basically, I mean, a nurse in big quotation marks. I mean, because there was no professional nursing before the Civil War. And so basically, anybody who could help was like drafted, come in and like give people water and um, change, you know, linens and things like that. And a lot of what Walt Whitman did was write letters home to these men, to their families, you know, because a, a lot of men died in his care. And so this was the last letter, the only letter that was going to go to their family. Um, he would also write little notes about things that people wanted, like somebody wanted some tea, and somebody wanted a special kind of, you know, um, candy. And um, so I, I decided that, I, or he also wrote, later, later in life, he wrote a book called Specimen Days, which is a really amazing book. It's really, I think it's the only prose book that Whitman wrote. And um, it, half of the book is all about 
his time as a nurse, mostly in the US Patent Office. So it was like really, really rich fodder for me to read you know, his memories of working in this hospital. And he, um, well, there's this story that he tells about coming into the hospital late at night um, after, he, after work, he, and um, all the men are sitting in there on their cots, because the, my installation had the cots you know, running this way, but there were actually so many men that the cots were going this way. And there's, this building has four spokes like this, and so all four spokes had, were lined with cots. And he went into one wing, and um, he heard these lady nurses. One of them was playing a little concertina, and the other ones that were singing, like, I don't know, Methodist hymns or something to these young dying soldiers. And he even wrote the, he wrote one of the lyrics of one of the songs. So I researched that song and then I learned a bunch of, of those hymns and I sung them in the performance. Um, and he wrote this really beautiful, he was very obsessed with the, and, and, and kind of freaked out by the fact that so many soldiers when they died on the battlefield, they did not get buried in marked graves. They were, you know, it was like the, the beginning of the idea of the unknown soldier. So, you know, 600,000 um, soldiers died in the Civil War. That doesn't even count all the civilians. Um, and 250,000 of them were buried in unmarked graves, which were usually, um, I mean, this is sort of really awful, but there'd be a pit that was cut, for, you know, that was dug for the horses, and then there was a pit that was dug for the men, because they had to bury people really quickly because it was really hot. In the summertime, it was really hot and disease would spread. You know, people were, you know, rushing off to the next battle. It was pretty horrible. And so, and sometimes people didn't get buried at all. They just like ended up sort of behind a, a tree or something. And really for, de for uh, decades and decades afterwards, people would find bones in, um, not very far from the surface in these, um, uh, these um, like cornfields that, you know, what that had once been battlefield. So he said this really beautiful thing about how he felt like the spirits of these men who were in these unmarked graves were, imbu were imbued in like all the grass and the flowers and the you know wheat that, that sprung up out of these um, feet, these like dark fields of battle, you know, in the years after the, the Civil War ended. And I, I was really inspired by that, that sort of idea of kind of this rejuvenation. So that's, that, that was kind of, that was the basis for this piece. So I filled the, um, the hallway with 20 cots. I made these sheets and on the bottom of each sheet, um, I embroidered the name of a, um, of a soldier that Whitman had written about in his, in his little notebooks. And I, um, and I would, I called out the name of the soldier and then I made the bed. Um, and then in the other direction, I came back and I opened up these, um, I had filled the pillows with these red um, felt flowers and I um, had stitched them very loosely with embroidery floss so I could just pull the floss out and then shake out the, the pillows um, and, and release the flowers onto the bed. So this was kind of, I mean, obviously it was referencing the bloodshed and the wound, but it was also referencing this possibility of like this rejuvenation and, and these flowers that were you know, growing, that were growing on the, on the battlefields. It also referenced the hair flowers and the other handcrafts that all the, you know, wives and mothers and sisters who were left behind it would have, would have been making for their lost um, loved ones. And there's one of the, um, the embroidered names. And that's kind of how it looked towards the end. Okay, and now I'm gonna to attempt to show you this video.
William H. Mills, <coughs> Delaware. J. G. C. <coughs> Company B, 7th Pennsylvania. Also, the, um, 
the names, while I was working on this project and I was talking to my dad about it, I, I realized that, or, that my, um, my great great grandfather, um, Isaac Osborne, was, um, had died in Gettysburg. And um, because he was a sergeant, he actually did have a grave and a gravestone. And um, so my dad gave me these copies of letters that that he had, that someone that you know his like grandmother had given to him, um, that were letters that Isaac Osborne wrote home to his wife and his kids during the war. And so um, I made um, I made one of the cots say Isaac Osborne. Um, and I also based the, the, the lettering on the, the names on Isaac Osborne's handwriting. Um, so um, I um, reached a point where I thought I would never be able to get out of a black dress again. And um, I felt like I was sort of condemned to be that Victorian morning culture lady. Um, and then I got invited to make a project at a recycling center. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I'm definitely not gonna be able to wear a black dress for this. So I got, um, it was a, it's a place called, um, uh, it's called Rare. Um, it, it's at a, a business, it's called Re Revolution Recovery, but the, um, it's, a, it's, called, it's the Recycled Artist in Residence. It, it's a residency in, that's embedded in this recycling center. So this is a place, the, the business is a place where um, construction and demolition, people, you know, wait, they recycle things from construction and demolition waste. So um, there's a, so if, you know, if a house is being like completely gutted and rehabbed inside or a new house is being built, all the, all the, um, you know, the, the, the stuff, like the wood, the drywall, the, all this, the, the rubble gets brought here and you know, the, the people have to pay to drop it off. Um, and then the company sorts through and they recycle as much as they can, um, which is a business, they, they get paid, you know, they, they sell like the plastic and they sell the metal and the, the copper and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a, and so those are the gigantic piles behind me, those are like the rubble piles. Then there's a smaller pile that I, would, I refer to as the personal effects pile. And that was the pile of people's belongings. So when a house was being, you know, was, was being cleared out because, you know, an old person died or they had to move into a care home um, or someone got evicted, then all of their stuff ended up at the dump and it was, go, it was headed for the landfill. And so what I did is I spent six months going to this place four days a week and digging through all these piles. Um, and you had to be really fast because, um, you know, one of those 1-800-GOT-JUNK trucks would show up and then we'd be like, we could see it coming in the window, we'd like throw on all our gear and, you know, put on our hard hats and run out. And then we'd have like 10 minutes while the thing was dumping to be like, oh, look at that, oh, let me get that, let me get that. And then some big giant backhoe would come and shove it into a pile and you might be able to get to it or it might have been lifted up and put like three stories high. Um, so it was a really amazing experience for me um, to work and it was so filthy. Like I, I always call it like, this is my, I, I clean, I cleanse my palate from <laughs> Victorian morning culture by working in this really, really dirty place. Um, but um, it was amazing the things I found there, like this curtain, this sheer curtain that you see here, I found that. And I found this insane big curtain there too. Um, and uh, you know, the, the artists that run the, the residency, um, they are totally amazing. I mean, they, they were, I wasn't allowed to be out there by myself. So one of them had to come out every time I went out there and they were going, to, they went to extreme lengths to help me pull things out. And um, so I was really, as soon as I saw that that's what was, I, I knew that was what I was interested in was the, um, these personal items. And I wanted to try to um, give these, these memories. Um, the piece was called Songs of Memory and Forgetting. And I wanted to give these sort of, you know, people's um, belongings kind of one last life. Um, and so there were, you know, photo albums and, um, you know, clothing and linens and um, and little teacups and like all these things that I could really see, like you could really see, see they were imbued with the, the the body of the people who wore them. Like you could see fingerprints on the on the um, the photos and um, you know I just felt like I was 
you know, I, I felt like the people's spirits were really still in the belongings. And so I, took, I developed a piece working with the, one of the artists who runs the center, who's a musician, and we, um, we basically wrote music and we played it on instruments that we found in the dump. Um, like four pianos came in in the time that I was there. Only one of them was actually playable after it had been dumped off the back of a truck. But um, so we, and then and then I, I took people through the site, um, you know, and I and I had um, I had I was collecting things and laying them out on tables and kind of trying to um, share the like get people to think about what happens to your stuff when you when you die. Um, part of it as like a kind of think about it before you buy that thing kind of things is going to end up in the, in the trash. But also this, uh, you know, like we are our things and we imbue our things with so much meaning. And then when we're gone, they're, maybe they mean something to somebody and may, maybe they don't. Um, so I was passing around little, this is like a pair of baby shoes that I found. Billy and I, like I said, we, we wrote some music, we played other, we did other covers of music, that, like some Appalachian folk music, which is something I'm really interested in, the songs, and some kind of R&B songs that sort of resonated, or your gospel music, I mean, that res resonated with the stories we were finding in the dump. We, I found tons and tons of letters, and so we wrote some music that was based on the, some text from the letters that we found. And uh, because Billy and this, his part, his, um, the other woman who runs the, cent the center, Lucia, they had they had licensed, they, they were trained to run, to work all the big equipment. So I was able to use all these amazing, like, you know, uh, excavators and backhoes and things like that. And then the one thing, the only objects that I actually made were these quilts that were, I, um, that were made of um, to all the, fo like, tons and tons of photographs that I found. Um, and. I still had one little holdover from Victorian times, which was that I was looking at these um, photos, there's these amazing photo collages that women made in the Victorian time that were like, where they cut out the photos in funny shapes that would make them like these, like little flowers and they have designs. And so that's what these, this black quilt was actually based on, kind of riffing off of a Victorian photo album. And, um, and the backs of the quilts were made with clothing that, um, you know, with the fabric that I found, like clothing and linens and stuff. That's another quilt. This was the quilt that was made from the, um, that was made from more contemporary photographs, and I felt a little bit weird about using people's faces that might be still alive, so I only used photos that didn't have people's faces in them. So I'll show you a little video clip of this. Um, Long, long ago, in the days of my childhood, fond were the memories when I stood at mother's knee. Then she placed a kiss on my forehead. Down Thank you. 
to share with you guys, things I found that I'd love for you to pass around. Now, the first one, which is my favorite, it says, My Richie's hair from his first haircut, age one and a half years old. So we can pass that around. This is Richie's first baby shoes. Pass that around. And then this one says, um, Dear Richie, my rosary, when I die, put it in my hands. Love you. just finished. 
um, in no, or I, I just took it actually deinstalled it on New Year's Eve. Um, so um, this was I got invited to do a project at the Black Mountain College Museum and Art Center in Asheville, Asheville, um, North Carolina, and it was part of this larger project called Active Archive, where they were in, you know I was the first artist they were inviting a contemporary artist to come and curate a show of artwork from their collection. And so that would be artwork that was made by the faculty and um, and students of that storied, amazing, um, you know, liberal arts college that only lasted from 1933 to 1955, but produced like totally amazing people like John Cage and Merce Cunningham and you know Robert Rauschenberg and all kinds of people. Um, and then to do my to do some sort of a performative response to it. So as I was researching the site, I got, or as I was researching their history, I became really interested in this very little known performance that happened there in 1936 by a Bauhaus theater artist who was only, only taught there for two years, a guy named Zonti Shawinsky. I never heard of him, that's for sure. He worked with a much more famous guy, Oscar Schlemmer. You've probably seen these photos from the Bauhaus Ballet when it was, you know, when the Bauhaus was still around in um, Dessau, Germany. Um, but Zonti Schwinski was an assistant to Schlemmer, and he had his own ideas about, about theater, and he sort of um, worked them, he, in the two years that he was at Black Mountain College, he, he um, mounted these amazing performances with the students there. Um, and so, he certainly didn't have quite the budget that um, Mitch Schlemmer had, so the costumes are a little more rough and ready. But I, when I was looking through the archives and I saw these photos of the of the performance that happened in 1936 with these folded paper costumes, I was like, okay, this is the, I want to engage with this. So I, what I ended up doing was doing a, a reimagined version of what this performance was called, specto drama play, life, illusion, and it was basically this very avant-garde theater piece that was um, exploring kind of how the audience perceives sight and sound. It was separated into four sections, sight, sound, time, and architecture or construction, and that's where the paper costumes were in the architecture section. Um, so amazingly, there were a lot of photographs that, that, still, that were taken during this, this performance only happened once in like the spring of 2000, or, or of 1936. And so this was during the site section. And these shields, um, they're, it's kind of hard to see in this, this light, but they were, um, they were actually colored. This is what, these are his, his drawings. And so, you know, the students were each holding one and kind of, you, you can see just their legs sticking out of the bottoms. So they were probably like, I don't know, almost five feet tall. So I had someone recreate these for me, sort of like the spinal tap version of it. They were like only this big because I wanted to be able to hold, you know, one in each hand. I mean, he called them shields. So I was like, all right, I'm going to use them as shields. Um, I was able to find the script for Spectrodrama that was published years and years later. And I think it had been doctored a lot to be really more his idea of what he wanted Spectre Drama to be necessarily, not necessarily what actually happened, but judging from the photos, a lot of those things did happen. Um, so I know that he was really interested in like color, how people perceive color, different colors. These, these shields were like different, explored different things, like different ways of visual representation, you know, like some geometric abstraction, realism, pointillism. Um, so I, you know, moved around. I took these shields off the wall from the installation, which totally freaked people out because I was touching the art, even though it was mine. And I moved around with those. Um, I worked. This, this was the photo that that really pulled me in. This, this curly costume and this like sort of cousin it kind of costume. And so I was able to get. Um, I, I, I was able to get a giant sort of enlarged version. You know, uh, one of those um, sticky decal type things that was attached to the back wall of the, this was the installation space, which then became the performance space. Um, and I worked with this um, amazing, this red-haired woman with a flute, this incredible musician, and she composed, because there had been all this music, like the score references all this music. And she, um, but, but of course none of it exists anymore, so the sheet music doesn't exist. They think it was probably improvised. So we did all this research into 19, like, avant-garde like chamber music from 1936 and 37 and she developed she wrote an entirely original score um, about you know that some of which um, 
some of which were these pieces, like larger, like that she would play. We would play instruments and record them in Philly, and then we played that in the space, and then then performed up live to that. So instruments and singing to that, and then other ones were um, like these ballads that we would just be singing duets, and they were all based on Goethe's writings about color, the emotional content of color that Joseph Albers had been, you know, the Bauhaus. Um, artist so known for color uh, that he had been really inspired by. Um, so I made these, you know, this, co this costume is a little bit more, looks probably more like an Oscar Schlemmer influence in it than a, um, than a Zonti Chwinski. But so I was wearing, this is the costume I started out in and then I took that off and I changed into this one and moved around in that. Um, and this one made really amazing sounds. I'm just gonna play a tiny bit of this video so you can hear what the sound of this costume was. So I was like kind of in a constant state of putting on costumes and taking them off in a very sort of scenes out kind of way.
and that I, I did almost an identical version of the, the original costume there. Yeah, so I'll probably just stop now because I'm way over in case anybody has any questions. Um, I don't um, I don't have any of, everything that you saw today is on my website, um, and which is just my name. If you just Google on my name, um, I think I might have it actually at the end of the PowerPoint. There it is. Um, so you could see more images and, and see the videos again. I haven't put up the stuff from Black Mountain College yet because it's I still have to edit the video together. What I showed you there was just stuff from that my husband took on his iPhone from the front row. Um, but um, do you guys have any questions or?
but then all the other trash around it was whatever happened to be there. So each performance was quite different. I, pick, I would pick things up and respond differently to them. So it's a bit of both. It's a bit of improvisation and a bit of sort of a planned path that I'm taking people through. Yes? Um, in the beginning of the video for the rear residency, there was this extended segment where you're sorting and kind of mirroring the activity of the, the larger The shipwreck. excavator, yeah. So I, I was wondering if, if you were thinking about over time the relationship between your kind of repetitive movements um, and relationship to the machines doing the same thing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that Thanks. That's that's. Um, I'm glad you're asking me that because I totally forgot to talk about that. Um, I was really inspired by all of the the, mo the movements. It was uh, that were art that were happening there on a daily basis. Like there was a whole room where, like a, they call it the sort line, where guys would be, you know, the the stuff that was potentially to be recycled was coming through on a. A conveyor belt and they were sorting like somebody's job was just the big plastic thing somebody's job was like the clear plastic someone's job was wood and I would watch them and they it was like it was so beautiful it was so they would get out somehow find a way to get out of each other's way and choreograph it was seen very choreographed and on the in the big um, flat area that they call the tipping floor even though it's outside um, the way that the, the um, it would always look like there was going to be some kind of a crash, like some 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 truck from the outside would pull in and be dumping, and then the guys who worked there had all these little mini trucks that they'd be buzzing around, like sort of like at the airport. If you ever like look out the window and you're about to take off and you see like there's cars driving on the runway and, and you're just like whoa, but they they do it so much that they know they have a they know how to how to they have a choreography where they move around each other and so. Watching the the like the arm or the mouth of the excavator come down and, and pick up these, these big like plastic things that would dangle down, I just thought it was really beautiful. And I really early on I said let's let's make some choreography that's based on that. I also um, the um, there, what you, there was I realized I didn't have a picture of this, but when people first came, after they came through that big orange curtain. There was a long, long like series of tables that I had made on saw horses with big pieces of wood, and all of the like the choice that like um, domestic items that I had collected over six months were all laid out on this table according to my taxonomy of like like you know glasses and you know and gigas and tons and tons of records and um, and and so I had had my own sorting, I, my own taxonomy of sorting based on basically sentimental value. And that was based on their taxonomy of sorting. It was based on what was going to sell in the market and what was going to be thrown out. So I tried to repeat and like um, mirror those gestures. So when we did the, we called it excavator mimicry, it was the thing when he, the Billy was in the big thing behind the pile and I was moving, that was a, like a more obvious version of the, the mimicry. Um, I also was really trying to create like intimate, little intimate spaces and humanize this very, very like overwhelming space that felt un very not human or very cold because it was outside, it was piles of trash, it was tons of metal and metal equipment and so I was trying to create these little places for the audience where we could gather and I could read them a letter like so they, so they could understand the humanness of this giant space. Um, I mean, it's always felt very human to me because when I'd be there during the week and the workers were there, you know, who I got to know, and they were totally awesome people. Um, they were, you know, they were always talking to each other, and they were, and they were fearless. They would just be like, something was coming off a truck, and they thought that. They thought their kid might like this, you know, this this truck, this little truck that was falling. They would just run out and grab it. I mean, I didn't dare do it because I don't think, you know, they didn't really have insurance for me. Um, but they were so awesome, um, the workers, because they um, they fig they sort of figured out what it was I was looking for. They would see me picking up like clothes and shoes, and then they would say they would take that stuff for me when I wasn't even there, and they put it in a pile that said for Martha on it. And it was cool. It was such an amazing experience. I felt a little bit like, you know, Marilyn Kelly's, the whole, you know, touch sanitation thing, because I was just like, wow, I'm really, they let me into this amazing world that I would never have any access to otherwise. And then I kind of wanted to 
recreate that world for the audience. And that's why I, um, you know, I wore sort of an outfit, kind of like what they wear. But that's why I like sang through the mega, you know, the, um, the walkie-talkie, and we use the megaphones. I was trying to use as much of the actual equipment as possible. And the sadness of a lot of the objects that you're calling out, like that really is really great, really where it's like place it in my hands when I die, but obviously it wasn't placed in our hands because it's mm -hmm. here. And I wonder if you could speak more about that, because like they're really funny and fun to watch, but then there's this sense of sadness too. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a great observation. Um, I mean, I forget that I even, like, whenever I start talking my work, about my work, I'm always like, oh my god, I'm such a downer, like everybody dies in the end. Um, I, I am just very interested in, you know, um, uh, in how we as a culture deal with death or don't deal with death now and loss and longing and sort of separation. And so it always seems to find its way into my work. Um, and part of, part of the reason why I, I really wanted to get out of the Victorian morning stuff is that I found there was almost no way to introduce humor into some of those pieces. Like, there was just nothing funny about the weeping dress. Um, and I have always, I guess it's sort of my Irish kind of upbringing, I, I have always felt like it was easier for people to take in something sad with like a little, you know, shock of humor either after or before. I feel like people are able, if you just like blanket them with grief, the people can sort of shut down. Um, and so I find that when there's a mix of the of a little bit of playfulness and the sadness, it reminds people that this is this is the way it is every day. Like this is the way life is. You know, there's some happy, there's some sad, there's babies born, people dying. It's all a mix. You don't really get to choose. Um, and I think my because these performances for the most part it's you know it's just me. It's me performing. Like I'm not playing a character. Um, and I'm, I'm just, um, you know, I may be wearing a period costume and I'm sort of channeling some historic event, but it's really still just me. And my personality type is to find humor in things. And so um, the, it, it, I, there was so much funny stuff in the dump, it was really crazy. So I, I, I just let it come through. And even with the, um, the show at Black Mountain College, there was some, you know, a little bit of sort of kooky humor, even though it was, you know, this like avant-garde 1936 um, thing. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry, we've run over, we don't have any more time for questions, but um, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Martha, for being here with us. Um,